All right, uh, welcome everybody. Good morning to uh, the new semester, summer term. Um, and uh, welcome to this lecture on effective field theory and the renormalization group. Uh, effective field theory and renormalization group are techniques and a set of tools. And actually, uh, not only a set of tools, but really a way to think about quantum field theory and renormalization. And actually, even more than that, uh, it's really a way to think about all of physics. And uh, anyway, the set of tools that we are going to describe has become very important in the last decades, both in condensed matter physics and also in elementary particle physics. And specifically in particle physics, which is our focus here, it has become very important in the last 10 years during the running time of the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, for a variety of reasons. And in the lecture, we will actually focus a lot on applications. I will explain you the way to think and also uh, the technical um, general background. But we will really go through a lot of important and interesting applications, which hopefully familiarize you with a way of thinking connected to effective field theory and the renormalization group. I have put you here already some, uh, uh, let's say, um, recommendations that you can read uh, at the beginning of the semester. This is more the philosophical background and uh, that brings you into the right mindset for thinking about effective field theory and renormalization group. Um, Phil Anderson uh, wrote a very influential um, paper. It's not a research paper, but more an essay. Uh, more is different, where he really proposes this way to think about emergence, that if you have some microscopic fundamental degrees of freedom and fundamental laws of physics, then at large scales, like macroscopically, there emerge new phenomena, which of course are fundamentally described by your fundamental laws, but nevertheless, uh, it's more appropriate to think about macroscopic degrees of freedom to describe macroscopic physics. And uh, examples to think about are water, where you know that water consists of fundamental molecules and the molecules itself consist of electrons and nuclei. Nevertheless, it's better to describe water by viscosity and macroscopic properties like density and pressure in order to understand how water behaves. And this is an example of uh, the statement more is different, in other words, uh, if you have a large number of degrees of freedom which play together, then new phenomena can emerge which uh, require or at least uh, make very useful uh, a dedicated macroscopic description. Similarly, there is a paper by Howard Georgi, also one of the pioneers of effective field theory, which is actually called effective field theory. And uh, if you Google for it, uh, you should uh, specify the date 1993, which is um, a review um, in a review journal on uh, the way to think about effective field theory. It's also a very non-technical paper. And technical references we will discuss as we go along. So in the lecture, uh, we will have, um, that is a little bit a mistake uh, of the planning, sorry about that, but uh, we have lectures on Monday and Thursday, Monday every week and Thursday every second week and uh, exercises every Wednesday. Um, I thought that we should have only uh, exercises every second week, but uh, now we have the room uh, every week, and so probably we will um, see whether we need it every week or whether we can drop some of the Wednesday dates. But for sure this week we will have an exercise on Wednesday to get started, and here is already the first exercise sheet, which you can solve until Wednesday. Okay, what is effective field theory? Um, as we already saw from this example with water and emergence of uh, macroscopic phenomena, it is really um, a tool to describe um, the dependence of uh, phenomena on the energy and momentum scale or equivalently on the distance scale or time scale. So what uh, the tools that we are going to describe allow us uh, is to analyze the low energy or high energy behavior of physical systems, the large scale or a small scale behavior of systems, 
And technically speaking, what we are um, working on is to analyze limits where ratios of momenta or masses become small or large. And understanding uh, the behavior of physical systems in such limits uh, is of course exactly necessary if you want to understand how uh, new macroscopic phenomena arise because that corresponds to some limit of certain momenta becoming small compared to, to others. Okay, so this is basically the outline. And uh, uh, okay, that is the motivation, but the outline of the lecture is that uh, we will actually cover a few different topics. Uh, of course, we will cover effective field theory and the renormalization group. Um, and in case you haven't noticed, uh, effective field theory is, um, uh, let's say, a special case of quantum field theory. So we rely here on quantum field theory. And therefore, um, as a prerequisite of this lecture, I assume that you have some basic knowledge of quantum field theory. I know that in the last semester there was a quantum field theory introductory lecture, so that should uh, be sufficient for you, or I did some quantum field theory lectures in the past. So the knowledge from there um, should be appropriate as a prerequisite for our lecture here. Um, as the name suggests, renormalization group has to do with the theory of renormalization, and I do not totally assume uh, that you already are very familiar with renormalization in general. Therefore, we will have here a chapter on renormalization in general. So I will start in the lecture with a brief recap of quantum field theory. We will do that today. Um, then we will introduce the ideas of effective field theory in a very simple setting. Then we will uh, have a section on renormalization in general, which is not specific to effective field theory. And then we will cover both effective field theory at higher orders and also the renormalization group. Let me also say that historically, uh, let's say the fields of if, and the ideas of effective field theory and renormalization group they developed out of a set of different directions and uh, we will not uh, completely trace the historical development, but it is um, not really um, unambiguous where to draw the line, what is uh, effective field theory and what is renormalization group. Certainly uh, the work by Anderson and also uh, other pioneers, Wilson and Katanov, uh, they use the term renormalization group, however, in a way which is very similar and almost identical to the way we nowadays use effective field theory. So the two are very strongly linked, and really it is the combination of both sets of methods that we will introduce which allows us to understand uh, such questions. Okay, um, so let us begin with uh, motivation and repetition. So, as a motivation, let us start from a maybe unusual perspective, if you think in terms of quantum field theory. Let's start with quantum mechanics. And in quantum mechanics, there is a typical set of postulates and axioms. And um, one of the axioms is that physical systems can be described by quantum states, which are a part of a Hilbert space. And then you typically need to understand a basis in your Hilbert space of states. And the basis states can be characterized by quantum numbers, and the quantum numbers correspond to a complete set of commuting operators. So one uh, way, uh, which, uh, one important uh, way to characterize 
quantum systems is to specify this complete set of commuting operators. This is typically not unique, but uh, you can always uh, specify at least one set of uh, commuting operators, which is complete in the sense that uh, no additional operator commutes with uh, the entire set, which is not a function of the uh, operators that you already have in your set. And let's start with an example. So let's write down the technical term, uh, complete set of commuting operators. And uh, let's start with a very well-known example, the hydrogen atom without spin. So as you would discuss it in an introductory quantum mechanics lecture, and then uh, probably you can specify a complete set of bases, uh, of basis states and then also of commuting operators. So the basis states are typically denoted like this, NLM. So you have three quantum numbers for the hydrogen atom, uh, the main quantum number, angular momentum, and angular momentum in Z direction. And uh, to this state, there corresponds the statement that there are exactly three such uh, commuting operators which form such a complete set. And what could be a choice of these three complete sets of operators? Uh, can you name a list of these three operators for the hydrogen atom, which correspond to these quantum numbers? Yep. For example, the harmonium, the angular momentum vector square, and the angular momentum in C direction. Yes. Okay, so this would be our complete set of operators, and uh, we can simultaneously diagonalize these three operators, and therefore we have a basis of our Hilbert space which uh, where every basis element is a simultaneous eigenvalue to all three eigen uh, uh, operators and I do not need to write down the uh, values of the eigenvalues but you know them for sure. So here in this particular example we have three operators in our complete set. Now do you know an example in quantum mechanics where you have less than three uh, in such a complete set? So less than three um, commuting operators. Harmonic oscillator. Harmonic oscillator, right. And uh, what would be one operator in this uh, set of one operator, an example? Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, but there would be some obvious alternatives which are maybe good to know. For example, uh, X would also classify as an operator or P because obviously you can find momentum eigenstates, you could find position eigenstates, or you can find uh, energy eigenstates, but uh, not simultaneously. So this is either or three obvious possibilities. Do you know an example with, uh, let's say, four operators in your complete set of operators? By the way, why uh, does the hydrogen atom have three and the simple harmonic oscillator one? Very simple, uh, very important physical uh, connection. Yeah. The, dimension. the dimension of space. It's the dimension of space. Here we simply have three dimensions of space and an alternative complete set would be Px, Py, Pz or X, Y, Z. So these are also possible sets of fully commuting operators. So, but now what would be an example with uh, four commuting operators? So, one example would be the hydrogen atom with a spin one half electron. Uh, 
So if you describe the hydrogen atom with an electron which has spin one half, then there would be four commuting operators, namely the Hamiltonian, the uh, angular momentum, uh, uh, sorry, LZ, or J square LZ, and the spin that uh, commutes. And then we have a system with four commuting operators. Now, we could go on, uh, and I could ask you about examples with five or six operators, but the obvious question now is, uh, is there the possibility of having infinitely many commuting operators? Does that exist? Where, of course, uh, these infinite, infinitely many commuting operators are independent of each other and correspond to different physical quantities which can take independent values such that you cannot write one as a function of the other one. So you could have states where um, basically all of these uh, observables simultaneously have uh, all sorts of independent values what could be such a quantum system? Maybe a field where you would have degrees of freedom at every point in space and at one time they all free? Exactly, so that is of course, the answer is quantum field theory and uh, that is our motivation of quantum field theory. And uh, the basic reason uh, that these infinitely many commuting operators exist is uh, space-time plus locality. So here for the hydrogen atom, we used the uh, three dimensions of space, but we did not use locality. But if uh, you think about locality, then uh, what space-time really is. So here is a space-time diagram, x and t. And then we have, let's say, a laboratory here, laboratory one. We have laboratory two here. Here we have, let's say, the moon and so on. And uh, a locality tells you that physics in one lab cannot influence the physics simultaneously at another lab, which is very far away. And uh, the moon cannot influence the physics in your lab, uh, uh, at least not what happens at the, on the moon at the same time. Because information propagates uh, with a finite velocity, namely uh, with a speed of light at most. And for this reason, physics in the different labs and on the moon and so on, must behave completely independently. And that means that there must be observables connected to the physics in lab one, other observables connected to physics at lab two, observables uh, on the moon, and so on. And all these observables must be independent of each other, which means technically that the operators describing those observables must commute. And since you can go on infinitely because space time is infinite, there will be an infinite number of operators. So that is exactly the point. So observables attached to different uh, finite regions of space-time. Um, must commute if no information can be transmitted fast enough. So this is loosely speaking, but uh, the technical statement is that now we get quantum field theory with local operators. 
and local operators really means local observables. So the new ingredient of quantum field theory is ob that observables are connected to space-time regions or in an idealized uh, way, uh, observables are connected to space-time points. So we have operators O index I, which depend on a space-time point X, where if I write just X now, that it means a space and time. Where we have a computational relation, some observable OI at some space-time point X, and another observable at space-time point Y, they commute if no information can be transmitted between the points X and Y, uh, and so the commutator is zero if the four-dimensional scalar product X minus Y square is smaller than zero. That means that the difference in space is bigger than the difference in time times the speed of light. So the speed of light is not sufficient to transmit information from one point to the other one. So mathematically, that is equivalent to saying that x minus y vector divided by the time x naught minus y naught is smaller than one, where one for us is the speed of light. Okay. And so that means that you cannot transmit information uh, from one space-time point to the other one. And that is the core of quantum field theory. Quantum field theory implements quantum mechanics plus space-time and locality. Um, and uh, therefore, it leads to an observable structure, which is uh, special. And uh, it's still uh, in the co uh, so fully in the realm of general quantum mechanics. So it does not violate any postulate of ordinary quantum mechanics. If you think of the postulates in the sense of Cohen Tanucci or any of the standard uh, postulate sets of quantum mechanics, but it is special in the sense that it has this infinite number of commuting operators which are attached to space-time points with such a structure. So you could think of quantum field theory as a special class of quantum theories with a particularly um, intricate observable algebra. Okay, and this has now uh, an impact on um, uh, this question at the top, namely what happens at high scales and at low scales. We now have an observable structure which is connected to space-time, operators connected to space-time points, and now we can ask what happens if we um, go to large scales or small scales. And let us uh, at least motivate a little bit from this general perspective the emergence of effective field theory. Namely, you can now do a so-called coarse graining. We start again with our space-time diagram x and t, and we know that fundamentally we have local degrees of freedom. So I symbolize here our many fundamental local degrees of freedom by these small uh, points. So these would be fundamental uh, local degrees of freedom. Um, like these operators which are defined at every space-time point and if you have some extremely close space-time uh, points uh, the, the operators would nevertheless commute because uh, at least for equal times. Um, but now let us imagine that you are a physicist um, who is interested in macroscopic phenomena. So you look at uh, phenomena which are characterized by very long wavelengths. So here this would be a very long wavelength lambda. Um, so this would be macroscopic 
phenomena. And you want to understand the physics at distant scales, lambda, which are very large. Okay. Then what you can do is coarse graining, namely you average over neighboring such local observables and uh, you replace these fundamental observables by, let's say, slightly bigger regions, which are still small compared to the very long distance scale that you are actually interested in. So here we still have our lambda. Uh, but the fundamental degrees of freedom have been averaged a little bit over some uh, larger space-time regions. And these would then be effective averaged degrees of freedom. And uh, just the picture should already suggest that something like this should uh, be possible. You should be able to describe macroscopic phenomena both by working with the absolutely fundamental degrees of freedom, but you should equally be able to describe the same phenomena by these slightly averaged degrees of freedom. And uh, therefore, you have two ways to describe your macroscopic phenomena, namely in terms of this theory and in terms of the average theory. That is, first of all, coarse graining. But the next step is that if you are a macroscopic physicist and you look from your macroscopic perspective onto this theory and you look onto that theory, then the character of the theory is basically the same. Because in both cases, this and that theory uh, is described by some degrees of freedom which live at smaller distance scales than the distance scale that you are actually interested in. So the second observation from this picture is that the effective field theory is probably a theory which has the same nature, the same characteristic, the same mathematical framework as the fundamental theory. And that means, uh, so this justifies the word effective field theory. If this is a local field theory with such a structure, then even after averaging, you should still be able to describe macroscopic phenomena by yet another quantum field theory where, however, the fields correspond to these average degrees of freedom. But uh, the suggestion of this picture is that by doing this coarse graining procedure, you don't, do not leave the space of quantum field theories. You just um, replace one quantum field theory by another one. So can describe um, a large scale phenomena, both by fundamental and by effective theory and effective theory is again a quantum field theory. So this is our intuition. And of course, uh, whether this is technically correct remains to be seen. But uh, this intuitive picture is the one that lies behind uh, the effective field theory and obviously it will turn out to be correct and I will give you technical reasons for it but the basic picture is, is the right one. So, and by the way, historically I said that we will not completely trace the historical development but uh, really this idea of coarse graining was introduced by Katanov and Wilson in the context of condensed matter physics in particular. And for them, it gave rise to a way of looking on to the renormalization group technique. Nowadays, uh, exactly this picture is the, um, um, let's say, basic way to understand effective field theories. And this shows you that the two kinds of concepts are really very closely connected. 
So, uh, do you have any questions at this point? We will next uh, start with a recap of quantum field theory, and that uh, in, in, in this part I would ask you to um, interrupt me if you have some questions. The exercise sheet will also uh, provide you with some repetition of quantum field theory, and uh, so we can then also on Wednesday in the exercise uh, fill uh, any gaps that you like to have filled. So are there any questions up to this point? No. Okay, then let uh, me clean the blackboard and let us do a small recap of um, quantum field theory. By the way, some more announcements. Um, first of all, uh, let me mention some other lectures. Uh, there is also in this semester a lecture called Standard Model Theory or Standard Model Advanced Theoretical Concepts, some title like this. Um, that is parallel to this one and it has roughly speaking the same um, audience group uh, as a goal. And uh, it also builds on top of quantum field theory, uh, but there you will learn more about gauge theories, Young-Mills theories, and how they be, are, are applied to the standard model. And uh, here we will, at some point of the lecture, also use a little bit uh, Young-Mills theories from the other lecture or from other lectures that you have uh, had in the past. But we will not so much focus on the theory of the standard model here, um, even though we will apply it. So at some point, uh, I will simply assume that you know what the standard model is and how to compute processes and Feynman diagrams in the standard model. But in the other lecture, uh, you will systematically be taught uh, the theory of um, gauge theories leading to the standard model of particle physics. And there is also a um, um, seminar on gauge theories, which uh, is also intended for master students, obviously. That is one announcement, and uh, the other announcement is the way we do the exercises and how to get a certificate for participation. So, um, as usual, this lecture here can be used for two different specializations. It can be used for specialization in particle and nuclear physics, and it can be used for the specialization theoretical physics. If you want to use it for theoretical physics, you need to get a certificate from the lecture which you get by doing the exercises. If you uh, want to use it for particle physics specialization, uh, you in principle do not need anything from the lecture, but I advise you nevertheless to get a certificate by doing the exercises because you should do the exercises no matter what. And uh, about the exercises and about the lecture, Last year we had a very nice system which I would like to use once again, namely you can do the exercises and um, uh, voluntarily some of you can hand in uh, written solutions, handwritten or LaTeX, however you want, and we can iterate the solution until it is really nice and then we can upload it onto the web page such that everybody can use the website with uh, provided uh, worked out solutions to the exercise for reference. And so um, we will discuss this also in the lecture. Maybe some of you can tell in advance that you are willing to do such an exercise and uh, provide a solution, or you do it uh, without announcing it uh, ahead of time. But that is a very nice system, uh, and last year we collected uh, really good solutions to a lot of exercises which was useful for everybody and uh, also for the ones doing the uh, solution themselves. And in, uh, okay, um, initially I planned to do the lecture without video, but now I got convinced that we will try it with video. So the video will be uploaded. Uh, we will see whether it's uh, completely public or uh, private such that only you can see it. But uh, it will of course be uploaded at some point. Nevertheless, uh, the same remark about the exercises could also be made about the lecture. So I plan, uh, not today, but 
uh, in principle, I planned that some lectures might be kind of spontaneous mixes between exercise and lecture. And then I will not have lecture notes for such improvised and spontaneous uh, mixes. Uh, but if anybody of you uh, then has a lecture note for uh, such uh, an improvisation lecture, then you could also uh, give it to me and we upload it onto the website of the lecture for everybody afterwards. That would also be a nice thing to do. So, um, but we can discuss this in more detail also on Wednesday. And if you have questions on how to uh, organize this uh, and how to select your specialization, particle physics or uh, theoretical physics, if you need advice, then simply ask me after the lecture. I can uh, tell you all details about this. Okay, uh, so let us then continue with the lecture. And we will now do a small repetition or, uh, of quantum field theory. And it's basically a, a small summary of the main results and uh, ingredients. So uh, I am talking, when I say quantum field theory, I mean relativistic quantum field theory. That means we are working in four-dimensional Minkowski space-time. There are quantum field operators. And generically, we might call them phi i of x or o i of x and so on. But in concrete theories, we could use all sorts of letters to describe the fields. Um, all observables are obtained as functions thereof. So that is really the definition of a quantum field theory, that there are basic operators phi of x, and uh, all observables of interest in the theory can be obtained as functions of uh, these fundamental quantum field operators. And then in order to implement relativistic invariance, on the operators and states. We have a representation of Poincaré transformations. More specifically, there must be a unitary representation of the Poincaré group. which we write as u of lambda and a. Um, and I will not say at this point more details unless you ask me to. So lambda is a Lorentz transformation matrix. A is a four vector which defines a translation in space time such that x goes to x plus a. And then uh, this would be in combination a Poincaré transformation where x goes to lambda x plus a combination of Lorentz and translation. And this is a unitary operator which you can apply onto your states in Hilbert space of the quantum theory. And this unitary operator implements on the set of states uh, this Poincaré transformation. And the fact that it is a unitary operator means that scalar products or probability amplitudes are unchanged under Poincaré transformations. And that means we have Lorentz invariants. So the quantum theory is invariant under these Poincaré transformations. And uh, then you could uh, study infinitesimal translations and infinitesimal Lorentz transformations. And you can, can expand this unitary operator into unity plus a small correction according to this infinitesimal transformation. And in this way, you get Hermitian operators corresponding to these uh, derivatives of the unitary operator, and uh, these are the so-called generators. And uh, these generators are operators J, rho sigma, and 
capital P mu, which are the four momentum operator of the theory and the angular momentum and boost operators of the theory. So they are automatically obtained from this unitary representation. Some of you might have been in my theory master lecture um, where we did basically the same for the um, context of angular momentum only in three dimensions where we had a unitary representation of rotations and here as a generalization we have a unitary representation of Poincaré transformations. So this is the basic setup of quantum field theory and then uh, let us here as a repetition only specify some uh, bare facts on perturbation theory. So in perturbation theory we have uh, a definition of our concrete quantum field theory model by a Lagrangian. Oops, and the Lagrangian can be split into a free part L0 plus an interaction part L int. And uh, the free part by definition is bilinear in the fields because if we have a bilinear Lagrangian and we quantize it then we know exactly how to quantize such a theory and the outcome of the quantization of such a bilinear theory uh, has the interpretation in terms of particles um, and quantized um, uh, waves which carry momentum and energy and therefore classify as elementary particles. Uh, on the other hand, uh, this is then everything else. And just to avoid confusion, of course, normally this contains the uh, terms which are not bilinear in the fields, obviously, but it is not forbidden that this might also contain some other bilinear terms as well. Um, so I want to avoid the confusion that you might think that this is not allowed to contain bilinear terms. It is allowed to contain bilinear terms. But that's uh, not an important remark, but uh, let me make this remark anyway. So then in perturbation theory, we go from the Heisenberg picture where we would have operators which I denote as capital Phi I of X to the interaction picture. Where we have operators which I denote as small Phi I of X. And uh, these interaction picture operators are defined according to the quantization of the free Lagrangian which we know exactly how to do. Therefore, we can calculate fully all the properties of these interaction operators, uh, small phi. So we can calculate all matrix elements uh, of all these operators. Arbitrarily high powers of these operators can be calculated easily in terms of Feynman diagrams. Then there is the so-called gelman low formula which um, specifies a very important relationship for green functions, which are general expectation values of uh, operators. So I don't know what you did in your quantum field theory, but for me, this omega stands for the ground state of the full interacting theory. And in this full interacting theory, you might want to calculate such an expectation value of, uh, let's say, phi i1 of x1 and so on, up to phi i n of xn. So this is a very general vacuum expectation value in the full theory of Heisenberg picture operators, 
which carry the full time dependence according to the Hamiltonian with interactions. So these are very complicated objects, but also very important objects which basically carry the information on the full dynamics of the interacting theory. Uh, in order to calculate it, you would need to know the full ground state with interactions and the full time dependence of the Heisenberg picture operators. So knowing this would mean to solve the theory fully. And uh, the Gelman law formula is a formula which uh, relates this to objects in the free theory. And uh, we have a denominator which contains just a free vacuum expectation value of the time ordered product of um, the following, namely the exponential of i times the integral over the interaction Lagrangian. And in the numerator, we have the vacuum expectation value in the free theory of the corresponding object with a small phi, phi i1 of x1 and so on up to phi i n at xn times the same exponential times the free vacuum. And so here this state is the free vacuum, the ground state of the free theory according to this L0. And these are the interaction picture operators uh, which we fully understand because we can quantize the free theory completely. And we know uh, in principle all the matrix elements uh, and we know exactly how these free field operators act onto the free ground state. Therefore, the right hand side here is completely calculable. And in perturbation theory, this would be a systematic approximation to the left hand side. Have you seen this formula before? Who has seen this formula? Can you raise your hand who has seen it? Okay, that is many but not all. So we can discuss more about it in the exercise or now if you ask me. So then there is the so-called Wick theorem which gives you Feynman rules. So basically here you have an expression on the right hand side where you have uh, only three objects free vacuum and free field operators and you know in principle how the free field operators act onto the vacuum and the Wick theorem uh, states that uh, this knowledge can be translated into Feynman rules, namely the right hand side can be expressed in terms of Feynman rules and uh, I will soon write down some example Feynman rules. So just a remark before we do that, that the derivation here strictly requires uh, the existence of uh, regularization and renormalization. <coughs> to guarantee uh, convergent expressions. So if you work in an unregularized theory, then uh, the left hand side and the right hand side are strictly speaking at first undefined. Um, but you can define uh, the theory in the context of some regularization where you have either space time replaced by a lattice uh, with finite distance between lattice points or you have a cutoff in momentum space such that uh, only uh, momenta are allowed below uh, some finite value and you cannot integrate up to infinity on momentum uh, space. Uh, but whatever you do, um, you need some regularization and once you have it, you can define uh, all the objects here mathematically. So, uh, okay, you um, can study this in any number of quantum field theory books and uh, online lectures. Uh, so uh, I have some quantum field theory lecture videos online that you can watch um, or uh, you can read the usual books. Um, maybe, let me ask, um, 
in the quantum field theory le lecture that you have attended, did you see such green functions at all? You saw it. Okay, uh, and also the Gelman low formula, obviously. Um, did you also hear about the so-called LSZ reduction formula, Lehmann, Zimanzik, Zimmermann? Who has? Oh. Okay, good. Then I think let me actually not uh, repeat here the LSZ reduction formula, even though it is important, but uh, let us maybe do this um, if it becomes necessary for us at, uh, at some point. It's not really necessary here. Do you want to know any more details about quantum field theory at uh, this moment? Yeah? Uh, could you say something about the convergence of the perturbation series? Interesting question. Um, because we can contrast this later with the convergence in effective field theories. So um, here, uh, the convergence that you are probably referring to is uh, the power series in, uh, that appears here through the exponential. So the perturbation theory um, is an expansion in powers of the interaction Lagrangian. So you can evaluate this at zeroth order in the interaction, then you are in the free theory, or at first order in the interaction, second order in the interaction, and so on. So the system systematic expansion comes from expanding this power series at some finite order. And um, that corresponds to an expansion in Feynman diagrams where you take into account more and more complicated Feynman diagrams with more and more vertices and lines. And uh, so that uh, constitutes a series expansion and that series does not converge. As far as we know, we know some explicit examples where it's definitely clear uh, that the expansion cannot converge and um, there are some general arguments that it probably uh, will uh, never converge. Um, and uh, therefore, uh, this series is what is called an asymptotic series. It's not a convergent Taylor expansion, but it is an asymptotic series where if you go up to some finite order, um, and the coupling constants are small enough, you can very well approximate the full result. However, uh, the convergence of all orders does not converge against um, the full uh, exact result. So there would be an exact result, but this expansion will not converge against it. But uh, finite powers approximate the full result with a small um, gap. Uh, which you can bring under control. So there are some mathematical theories to, um, or approaches to quantify the mistake that you are making. And this mistake is um, numerically not significant in many applications of perturbation theory, for example in QED, but it can become numerically very significant in, for example, hadron physics where perturbation theory just uh, never describes in any reasonable approximation um, the correct physics. Okay, um, let, us, let us exemplify this by uh, Feynman rules. So as I said for the lecture, at some point we will probably do um, serious particle physics as well and then um, uh, at some point in the semester I might ask you to know the standard model of particle physics but uh, it is not really necessary at the beginning. So uh, let us start with some simple example, namely phi to the 4 theory. This is a very famous toy model quantum field theory where we have one scalar field. So let's be specific. It is a real scalar field. Well, the corresponding operator is Hermitian, which is called phi of x. And then the Lagrangian L is given as one half d mu phi, d mu phi minus m square over 2 phi square minus g over 4 factorial 
phi to the four. And then you see here the standard kinetic term for such a spinless scalar field with a derivative d mu d mu contracted in a Lorentz invariant way. Here you have a mass term, m square over two times phi square, which gives mass to this uh, scalar field and the corresponding particle. And here you have a phi to the four interaction, which is why the theory is called phi to the four theory. And um, then in perturbation theory, we would treat this as the free Lagrangian and that as the interaction Lagrangian. And then I guess in uh, your basic quantum field theory lecture, you went through the procedure to quantize exactly the theory described by this L0, which is really the very simplest uh, free quantum field theory that you can have. Uh, you would discover that you can represent the uh, phi field by creation and annihilation operators, and uh, there is a ground state. If you act onto the ground state with the creation operators, you create states which have the properties of particles with a specific relationship between energy and momentum, namely the energy-momentum relation is such that the variable m corresponds to the rest mass of the corresponding particles. So one sees that this quantum field theory uh, describes actually a theory of elementary particles uh, with rest mass m. But uh, then we can study the interactions and uh, then we get Feynman rules. and. Uh, what are the Feynman rules corresponding to this Lagrangian? So, uh, do you know this by heart, or can you read it off, the set of Feynman rules for this Lagrangian? I think it was something like four points per mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Correct. So a four-point vertex, and uh, this four-point vertex now has a mathematical value. Feynman rules um, correspond to precise mathematical factors in Feynman diagrams, and what is the factor corresponding to this Feynman rule? Yep. Minus I times G. And how did you know this? Yes, so here you look at the interaction Lagrangian, then you see a term which contains four powers of the field. The four powers tell you that there must be four lines attached to a vertex, and then you get the prefactor by taking the fourth derivative times i. Let's write it down. So it corresponds to evaluating this interaction Lagrangian derivative with respect to four powers of the field. That cancels the four factorial, uh, and we get this Feynman rule. And uh, the fact that we get this relationship here is also the reason why we introduce the four factorial here in the first place. That is just there in order to make the Feynman rules look simpler. Okay, but that is not the only Feynman rule in the theory. There is a first, that is the second Feynman rule. There is a first Feynman rule which you know even before that. And that is the Feynman rule, which comes from the quantization of the free theory. Namely, the quantization of the free theory gives you the information on the propagator of the particle, of the free particle. So the propagator, the lines in Feynman diagrams, they come from the quantization of uh, the free part of the Lagrangian. And what is the result for the propagator? It depends on the momentum which flows through the line. And does anybody know the Feynman rule for this propagator? I over p squared. Yes, I over p squared minus m squared. Uh, we can here also write down plus i epsilon. Um, we will often not write this, but maybe at this point, let's write this plus i epsilon prescription, which is important for the cases where you have an integral maybe 
and uh, the denominator would become zero. If you integrate and the denominator becomes zero, then the plus i epsilon gives you a prescription how to treat the pole in such an integral. And uh, the plus i epsilon then gives you some complex uh, or in, and imaginary parts which um, you can use in residue theorems, for example. And that is the correct uh, structure of the propagator coming out of the calculation of the quantization of the free Lagrangian. If you want, I can remind you of that calculation, but if you do not want it, then I will not remind you of the calculation. So, uh, another case would be a QED. So, let us remind ourselves of the Feynman rules of QED. That is also quite important. While I clean the blackboard, you can already remind yourselves of the Lagrangian and the Feynman rules of QED. Okay, um, QED. Did you learn about, who learned about QED in the past? Okay. Um, those of you who did not learn about QED, I will ask you later maybe what is going on. Um, but what is the uh, QED Lagrangian? Let's split it into the free part and the interaction part. So the free part of QED uh, is psi bar i d slash minus m times psi minus one quarter f mu nu f mu nu. Um, ah, okay, and then plus uh, uh, Lagrangian for the so-called gauge fixing. So let's also write down the gauge fixing Lagrangian. Uh, but more importantly, the interaction Lagrangian. The interaction Lagrangian would be minus E Q psi bar gamma mu psi times A mu. And the gauge fixing Lagrangian is um, in the simplest case one half D mu A mu overall squared. So uh, there is a generalization of this gauge fixing term where you have some so-called gauge parameter psi appearing. And here in this case, I put this gauge parameter psi simply to one um, because we will not uh, need to discuss here a lot the gauge dependence. Okay, so this is the QED Lagrangian and typically um, you would combine the free Lagrangian and the interaction part to a covariant derivative, which is very important to understand the gauge structure. But in order to derive perturbation theory, it is important to split it into the free part and the interaction part. So here in the free part, we have an ordinary derivative. Uh, do you know the d slash symbol? Who doesn't know the d slash symbol? Do you know the d slash symbol? Yes? Ah, okay, very good. Um, then uh, this simply uh, gives us the following Feynman rules. So here in the uh, QED, in the free Lagrangian, we have a description of two fields. Uh, the psi field, which corresponds to electrons and positrons, and the A mu uh, field, which corresponds to photons. So we have two propagators, and uh, we use uh, a normal line for the electron propagator, and if the momentum P flows along the direction of the arrow, which characterizes the flow of the E minus charge, so E minus flows from here to here, or E plus flows in the opposite direction, and the momentum P flows in this direction, then the rule is given as what? Who knows the rule for this propagator? I over P slash. Yeah. And so this P slash is a matrix. Um, and uh, so you can 
put it into the numerator by expanding i times p slash plus m divided by p square minus m square, and then you can also put again this plus i epsilon. So this is the same. Okay, and then we have a photon propagator. There also the momentum flows from left to right and the two ends of the lines are characterized by Lorentz indices mu nu which correspond to the photon field which carries a Lorentz index. So if we have this index structure mu nu, then the rule is given by minus i times the metric tensor g mu nu divided by p square plus i epsilon. And this would become more complicated if we would use a different kind of gauge fixing here. For example, if we would use this general xi, then there would be a xi dependent terms here in the propagator. And uh, that gives rise to very long winded and interesting discussions that we did, for example, in our quantum field theory lecture one year ago. But uh, let's not repeat that discussion here. But this is the uh, set of the three Feynman rules for QED, and then there is the interaction vertex, which looks like this. So we have an interaction between one photon carrying a Lorentz index mu and an incoming and outgoing electron or positron, and then the Feynman rule for this, who knows it, or who can read it off from the Lagrangian, again, by taking the appropriate derivative times i gives minus i e q times gamma mu. So that is really just the coefficient of the interaction Lagrangian, which multiplies the product of the field operators. So each line corresponds to a field operator, psi bar psi a mu, and uh, e q gamma mu times i is the rest. So this is the Feynman rule of QED. Um, I could write down a general recipe for Feynman rules. Do you want me to write this down, or is it obvious enough? Uh, I have the feeling it's not obvious enough. Let me write it down. And then we do some exercises. So the general uh, recipe would be the following. Um, if you have a free Lagrangian, you can bring it into the following form. Um, one half phi i times some differential operator d i j times phi j or similar. Okay. Or similar means that there is not always the one half. The one half would be specific for real scalar fields. Uh, for spin or fields, psi bar psi, you would not have the one half, but you would have psi bar i psi j and so on. But the point is, here we have a general differential operator. Like this id slash minus m. This is such a differential operator. And once you have such a differential operator, uh, you can immediately write down the corresponding propagator Feynman rule which now connects a field with index j and a field with index k. So here we have many fields in our theory, uh, and the most general bilinear term has some quadratic um, coefficient uh, or some matrix valued um, uh, coefficient in front of such a generalized quadratic term. And then uh, there will be a matrix of propagators from any field to any other field. So the propagators go from field J to field K, and the momentum flows in the direction from J to K. Then, uh, let's give it a name. This would be the propagator I times P J K, which depends on the momentum. And the rule is that the differential operator D I J, if you replace I times the partial derivative by a momentum P mu, times the propagator p j k of p that just gives a Kronecker delta i k. So the rule is that the propagator matrix is the inverse 
to the matrix of differential operators if you replace the derivative by momentum in Fourier space. And you see that this works. So here in the DIRA case, I D slash becomes P slash minus M, and then the propagator is I divided by P slash minus M. And so here, for example, you could write this uh, up to partial integration. You could write this as minus, or let's say one half, phi times <coughs> minus d'Alembert operator minus m square times phi. Okay, so this L zero could be written after partial integration. You put this DMU here with a minus, then you have minus d'Alembert operator minus m square. Then you replace i times partial differential uh, by p mu, so that becomes p square minus m square, and then the propagator is indeed one uh, i divided by p square minus m square. So this rule is the general rule how you can read off propagators from the free Lagrangian. Then for the interaction Lagrangian, if you have a term which consists of a prefactor, which is some numerical prefactor times, let's say, phi i, phi k, phi j, plus and so on. Then from such a term in the interaction Lagrangian, you get a rule uh, where you have an interaction vertex and incoming into the vertex, there are three lines corresponding to the fields phi i, phi k, phi j. And uh, the rule is given by i times the derivative of the interaction Lagrangian with respect to these corresponding fields, which is in this case simply i times g. But the derivative could produce some symmetry factors like two or four factorial and so on. So this is the general rule. And in this way, you can read off the Feynman rules for any quantum field theory which is defined by some Lagrangian. <laughs>